description for what's, what's going on here. And so um, Paul is really, I mean, <laughs> has gone through this a number of times um, as we've been studying, I mean, since 21, uh, chapter 21, that is. I mean, this all kind of bubbled up uh, in the beginning uh, with this angry crowd um, where Paul gave a sort of defense in front of them, um, eventually uh, getting put into the hands of, of the, uh, the Romans. Um, and then, uh, under the request of, of the Jewish people, he was brought before the Sanhedrin um, to give another defense. Um, and then yet again, before uh, Felix, uh, who basically, at the end of the day, wanted to get a bribe out of, out of Paul and, they, and kept him in captivity for, for two years. Um, so this has been quite, quite a long timeline so far that this has been going on. Um, it might not feel like it as we read through these chapters, but um, this, is, this has been a while. And he's basically been in a sort of um, uh, house arrest sort of state as they uh, hold him before uh, sending him on to, 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 see, to a Caesar. And so uh, Felix eventually uh, went away. Uh, I believe there was a, a riot in Caesarea, um, and he was replaced by Festus. And so now, um, now he's uh, been before Festus in, in the previous chapter, and Festus has been stuck with this problem that uh, his predecessor uh, essentially gave him uh, with having to, what to do with Paul. He's, he's appealed to uh, Caesar, and he's got to go to Caesar. Um, but he's stuck left with, what do I write? Um, what do I have to say about this man before I send him on to Caesar? He doesn't want to look like a, a fool um, in front of, of uh, the Roman government. So um, basically, he's asked now uh, uh, King Agrippa to listen to him and to maybe uh, give him some, some commentary to try to understand what it is that they're supposed to write uh, before they send him on to, uh, to Caesar. And this is really where, where Paul finds himself. Um, so I won't spend too much time because uh, Uncle Ken also spent some time on this, but I thought it was just interesting. He mentioned la or two weeks ago when he spoke on 25, um, King Agrippa's uh, background and his, his Herodian line. I found this cool graphic online that uh, I thought I would share, and you know the, the complexity that, that uh, Ken described a couple of weeks ago is kind of illustrated here. Um, it was a really, really complicated family. I'll say that again. Um, you know, not not great people. Under each of these names, you can see some of the really terrible things that they've done um, uh, against uh, Christianity, against uh, the, the gospel, and so. Um, they were rough people, but uh, King um, uh, Agrippa was probably the nicest one <laughs> so far. Um, he was in the fourth generation of, of the Herods, I believe the last. Um, and he's rumored to have had some sort of relationship with his sister Bernice, uh, too, there. Um, so, yeah, a very strange audience that, that Paul finds himself in front of between Bernice and, uh, and uh, King Agrippa. So moving on, um, and getting it really into to Paul's defense here, um, he begins his defense basically um, describing his roots uh, in the Jewish faith, um, where he came from, from the strictest sex, sect of Judea, Judaism, Judaism, um, and he was not an outsider to, to the Jewish people. And, and we've heard this before um, well, numerous times uh, when Paul um, explains his background. Um, so I won't spend too much time there, but um, it's interesting that he starts out in this way. And then he, uh, he starts referring to, um, some, some promise, uh, to a promise. And so I thought maybe we would uh, read a little bit from that passage, uh, which I think starts around uh, yeah, verse 6 of uh, chapter 26. And it reads, And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is, the, this is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? And so it's interesting that Paul, um, this is how Paul is basically presenting um, really the core of, um, of what he's uh, accused of. Um, 
he's, he's basically, and I think that, you know, as we try to dig a little bit deeper into this, I thought maybe we should really kind of deep dive a little bit onto um, what is this promise that Paul's referring to. We get sort of a clue um, in verse 8, uh, where he's talking about, uh, you know, you're asking this question, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? It seems to be, uh, as we've seen earlier in Acts, uh, kind of a stumbling block for um, the Jewish uh, people between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in fact, when Paul was before the Sanhedrin, he, he raises this uh, question, which causes a you know, big uh, stir amongst the Sanhedrin because it's, it's a point of uh, controversy within uh, the Jewish faith at this point. Um, and so unpacking that a little bit further, um, what we know, what we understand is that this is really all rooted um, in the, the covenant that was made uh, by God to, to Abraham all the way back in, um, in Genesis. And so I'll read uh, from Genesis uh, <coughs> chapter 12, uh, verse 1 through uh, 3, where this is made. I think I only have 2 through 3 up here, but I'll start at 1. Uh, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and, I will, who, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this is uh, the, the covenant, the, the promise that was made with Abraham all the way back in Genesis, and I think all of us uh, here know that. Um, and I believe this is really the, the, where the beginning of this, uh, this, this is uh, coming from in, here in, in Acts, which is about this promise that God made um, to Abraham. Um, it points to, verse 3 of this, points to the promise of, of uh, blessing and redemption. It's basically, it's pointing to the Messiah which the Jews would have understood from prophecy even further back in Genesis uh, back in Genesis 3 where this first came up. And I don't believe I have a slide for this, but I'll read from Genesis 3, uh, 15, uh, 14 and 15. Uh, so the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Um, you know, so this is looking, really saying that the offspring of, of man, uh, of this woman, um, would eventually crush the, 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 the serpent. Um, and that being the Messiah or, or Jesus. Um, so really this, this, this began way back in the beginning of, of, of Genesis. And so um, the Jewish people have basically had this promise for, for thousands of years uh, at this point, um, this hope, this promise uh, that the Messiah was coming to, to crush um, their enemy and to uh, redeem uh, Israel. This is what uh, the hope would be that, that, that uh, these Jewish leaders are talking about and what Paul is talking about here, this, this promise of this hope. Um, and basically, the, you know, the, the issue here is that uh, the Jewish people, again, have had this promise for thousands of years, and they, the, uh, they've watched uh, Abraham and, and many of the old, uh, over the fathers, the ancestors, um, physically die over the years. So they, they died. They never saw um, this promise, that um, was so, this, this ancient promise that they've always held on to. Um, and so, or they didn't believe that they've seen it. And so... <clears throat> This is where uh, I think Paul is kind of starting his argument. There's this promise, and, and there's a difference between um, uh, what there seems to be, and this is kind of where I'm getting into this whole uh, paradox. Um, they're, they're, the Jewish people are missing the element that they don't, you know, they, they're missing this element of resurrection from the dead, that Jesus, you know, being the first to be re resurrected from the dead, is the answer to the, this paradox that, that we're going to get into. Um, but yeah, there you know, and we'll, we know this from, uh, from Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Um, again, going back to this idea that the forefathers had died in the faith, but um, that's not, not the end of it. Um, and I'll read from verse 11, or from chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. 
These all were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned on something better for us, so that only together with, with us would they be made perfect. Now, I think the fact that, of the matter is, is that God, um, he doesn't fail to deliver on a promise. That, that's just fact. <laughs> so, um, you know, what the struggle is, is, shouldn't be really a struggle, that God will always deliver on his promise um, in his time and in his way. And I think it's in his way and time that we, we often struggle with. Um, you know, the, this paradox that Paul um, seems to be encountering here is that, um, you know, paradox being something that's seemingly absurd or self-contradictory, um, but when you investigate and explain, it can be proved to be well-founded. Um, you know, Paul's hope that he once shared with these Jewish um, uh, men and women is the same hope that they're persecuting him for it. But the difference is, is that Paul's hope is now is his living hope. And I think that uh, the Jewish people did not understand that or did not believe that. Um, and so this paradox, you know, has to be resolved. And how do we resolve it? And I think the answer is simple. It's, the answer is faith specifically faith in the risen Savior. And that's, that's the key here, is that he died and rose from the grave. Um, we're in this Lenten season where at the end uh, we celebrate that he rose from the grave. And that, that is the key, <laughs> that he, he got up and he rose from the grave. Otherwise, this doesn't make any sense at all. And continuing on in Hebrews, we read, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about uh, what we do not see. You know, the faith uh, that is in nothing, that you just have hope in, in nothing, is kind of pointless and sad. Um, and then faith or confidence that you might have um, in something else, confidence in your job or uh, things of this world, is basically misguided. Um, it's the hope that we have in God, in our Savior, that is real. And this is what... Uh, you know, Paul is really kind of struggling with is that the hope, his hope is, is really born out of the, the same promise that uh, this Jewish leadership uh, had. And so I think that um, we continue to consider this, this covenant a little bit. I think it might help. Um, so jumping, I guess, continuing on in Hebrews, uh, it's interesting, actually, as I went through a study how much you know, I was going really back to this chapter of Hebrews. But in Hebrews 11, uh, 17 and 19, it reads, uh, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And in so manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Yeah, it's interesting here that we see, again, consider this covenant that God made with Abraham uh, way back. And, and Abraham you know, believed the promise that God had given him. Um, still went to the, to the point of, uh, of being willing to, to, put, to give up his only son and, and sacrifice him um, as God had instructed. And so in doing so, um, he basically saw, uh, he saw the, the, you know, the, he saw the Messiah in this act. Uh, he's basically acting out the gospel in this way. And so um, he, 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 had, he basically was able to reason um, that the only way that this could work, being this is his only son, his only son was that God could raise him from the dead. And so that was the faith that, that Abraham had. Uh, that's really the key, the key to, to all of this. And it was interesting in, in um, John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus himself says this. Um, actually, I'm going to read a little few, few verses back um, from here just to kind of give a little bit more, more context. But uh, 56 is kind of the key verse that I wanted to highlight. <clears throat> Uh, I'll start in, in 51. Very truly, I, will, I, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they explained, now we know that you're a demon, you are demon-possessed. 
Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And I think that, um, that Jesus is really getting to the, to the fact that in this act, when Abraham was uh, offering up Isaac and he saw what happened in that, that moment, um, that his faith became sight in a way because he understood um, you know, the, the message and he understood that the Messiah um, was coming. And so uh, he died uh, in faith, but he did see um, Jesus' day. He, he understood. Uh, and so really, in, in similar manner, kind of coming back um, to this, this chapter, you know, Paul had a direct encounter um, with the Lord on the road to Damascus that literally turned him from darkness into to light. Um, and Paul expresses that here in the retelling of, of, of his conversion on the road to, to Damascus, uh, which this is really the, the third time um, in the book of Acts that we've now heard this, uh, this story. Uh, and it's really interesting and it got my mind going a little bit. It's like this is now the third time we've heard very similar words um, spoken by Paul and, and others about Paul's uh, conversion. It's like, why is this, why, this is interesting that Paul is going here in his defense uh, before this, um, this uh, king, uh, King Agrippa. You know, I think that at the end of the day, um, he's trying to deliver uh, the message that, that uh, Jesus asked him to deliver uh, on the road to Damascus before Agrippa. Um, that, that was what Jesus asked him to do, and that's what he's doing. Um, Paul's whole goal in life was really to, to seek that, um, as we read in, uh, oh, where is it? Yeah, verse 18, um, he, he's looking to turn people from, from darkness to light so that they mis may receive forgiveness from sins and, place them, and be placed among those who are uh, sanctified in the faith. And again, <laughs> This is, this is our goal, too, as, as believers. Um, you know, we want to share Christ's love uh, with others. We want this cloud of uh, witnesses that we read here in, in Hebrews 12 um, to expand. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, and so we, we, share, uh, we share our hope, our living hope, uh, with those around us. And, and so that was, kind of turns me really to the, to the third point here, um, about sharing the message of hope uh, with others. And um, I guess what I mean by that is, uh, as again, as I was thinking about, you know, what is going on here in this chapter, this third time, this retelling of, of Paul's conversion, and even in my own mind, it's like, yes, I've heard this story many times, and I, and I think all of you here have heard this many times. Um, and kind of in the same way, if you really think about it, and, um, you know, and so it's like we know Paul. We know you know, his story, but, but King Agrippa didn't. Um, and so what Paul is really doing here is, is giving his testimony at the end of the day. Um, and I think that was, you know, for me, the biggest thing I want us to take away um, from today is this, uh, the power of, of giving our testimony um, to others, uh, especially to, to non-believers. And so... I think that's, that's kind of, you know, his defense isn't really a defense more as it is just him uh, speaking to King Agrippa and to those there with him uh, about what Jesus has done uh, in his life, um, the transformative power of Jesus. And, he, you know, he bases it, I think, um, in this, this promise uh, because King Agrippa would have understood this promise, him uh, being Jewish himself. But at the end of the day, he's, he's, he's giving his testimony. And I think we can glean some, some encouragement from that, uh, especially if when we're in trials. But, 
it's really a lesson to us that this is, this is a way, this is a powerful tool that we have um, to share that love with, uh, and that message of hope uh, with others around us. Um, I found a couple of psalms, um, or verses in the psalms that are, are kind, of, uh, kind of illustrate this. And I'll share from Psalm uh, 71. <clears throat> um, oh, did I lose it? I lost it. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all, the day, all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim, pro- proclaim your, act, your deeds, or righteous deeds uh, alone. And then from Psalm 66, come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. And I think that the attitude of the psalmists here um, ought to be our attitude. We ought to, to be excited to come and, and proclaim to those around us uh, what Jesus has done uh, for us in our lives. Um, I think that this is, you know, for me, a big takeaway and, you know, personally just, uh, you know, encouraging but also challenging is that um, we need to be ready to, to do that. And Paul clearly is. Uh, he's before these, these very important people, and he, he, it doesn't phase him once a bit or whatsoever. You know, we see right in the beginning of the chapter, chapter Agrippa says, you have uh, permission to speak for yourself. And Paul just motions with his hands, and I can't do what uh, Uncle Ken did last week. He had a good motion with his hands. But he motioned with his hands, um, and, and he just dove right into the, this, this, this telling about his life and about um, his testimony and how he came to be where he is today in the transformative work of, of Jesus. And so as you kind of read through what, um, Paul is saying here, it's sort of a template on, on how to, uh, to tell our, uh, our testimonies. Uh, you know, if you could break it up into really four pieces, um, Paul talks about his life before Jesus. He talks about coming to know Jesus. And then he talks about his life um, in Jesus. And then finally he invites others to know, uh, to know him as well. And we can see that throughout this, this defense, um, all, all the way starting in verse 1 and through, uh, I believe, 20, 29, so most of the chapter. Um, verses 1 through 11, uh, he spends time really talking about who he was within, within Jewish society, who he was spiritually, and even really talking about his, how, where he was emotionally uh, before Jesus. He was quite angry. <laughs> you know, he was, he was viciously attacking the church and... Um, you know, very zealous about um, his understanding of the law, and and that was who Paul was. And then he gets into uh, you know how he came to know Jesus, which you know for us I think it's difficult to relate because he had a very direct interaction um, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, but he gets into that in verses twelve through eighteen, how he came to know Jesus. Um, you know, for his in Paul's case, I mean, there was this just immediate. Um, literal light that he, he, he was turned to. Um, and, but for many of us, you know, I was thinking about it for many of us, I think, um, maybe that looks a little bit different. Maybe it was more gradual. And I think that, you know, that's okay. But I think it's still an important part of each, each one of our stories and, and critical to uh, a, a powerful testimony that we're going to share with others. Uh, and then in verses uh, 19 uh, through 23, he talks about his life uh, in Jesus. And, and likewise, we ought to be able to tell others about how our lives have changed since uh, putting our faith in Jesus. Really, those, those, those are really the most powerful parts of our testimony that, that we can share. And, um, you know, as I thought about, about um, giving a testimony, I mean, I think that, that, you know, one of the reasons why maybe we're reluctant to do so is because we're not, Prepared, and I think again that this is a uh, a great template, and that we ought to be able to uh, be ready uh, to to share um, our stories in, in in like manner. And then finally, um, Paul invites others to know him, and we see that in verses nineteen through twenty three, um, where Paul basically puts the question to Agrippa, you know, do you believe the prophets? <laughs> You know, he understood that Agrippa had some knowledge of this, and he just put the question in front of him. 
do you, it's like, do you believe um, that Jesus was the Messiah? And so, um, very, very, I think, powerful message. And, and when we give our testimonies, I mean, I think it's, a, again, a very powerful tool when we're, when we're reaching out to others who might not know Jesus. Um, even to ourselves, to be honest, that, you know, as, a, as an encouragement uh, for one another to see other people's stories, um, which are not so far away. It, it might feel sometimes if we, you know, just quote scripture to, uh, to somebody who doesn't believe that, you know, that, that might not land with them. Um, but telling a story about our own lives and how Jesus has interacted with our own um, heart uh, is is much more power. It can be very powerful. I don't know if it's much more powerful, but um, it, it's it's uh, it's a way that we can reach people um, and they can relate to 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 our story and to uh, understand what Jesus is and who He is and what He is to us. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's that's um, one of the biggest points. If if you take nothing away from from this message. You know, is the power of our testimony, uh, and I thought it was kind of interesting this morning in the family Bible or the um, breaking of bread when Dan was talking about um, you know growing old and and uh, as we grow old, our our story it it evolves, it changes. And our testimony isn't just this little story that you know was one one off story. It, it, it continues to evolve um, throughout our lifetimes and becomes richer. And we can share more and more as we get old. It's, it's, as Dan was explaining, one of the benefits of getting old um, is that that story just becomes richer as you can see how God's promise is, is fulfilling itself in, um, in your own life. Um, even to, to, to death. I mean, I, I was thinking about the, the memorial service that we went to a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, and in, in the memorial service of a believer uh, often has a, Someone reading the testimony about their lives. They're not there to say it anymore, but it still gets read and, and, and spoken on even when they've passed away. And it's still that powerful even in that moment um, for those there. And, you know, in those sessions, in those meetings, uh, you know, we could have many people that don't know Christ. And so um, it's really just a, a very important tool that we have in our bag as we try to, to reach others. And so um, do and just challenge and encourage each one of us here to, to think about that a little bit more, to maybe think about our own testimonies and, um, and preparing them, um, and even in our own minds. I don't know if you literally have to write it down, but um, to be prepared uh, when, the, when the opportunity comes. Uh, you know, Paul was, in this case, uh, prepared in front of all these people. He wasn't intimidated. He, he was ready to to share. He knew what he was going to share. Uh, he had really years to think about it, to be honest, uh, sitting there in this, uh, in this, uh, in chains, but he, he was ready um, when the moment came. Um, and Agrippa even says, uh, you know, do you think you can uh, persuade me to be a Christian uh, in such a short time? Um, and Paul's, Paul's response is great. It's like short time or long I pray that not only you, but all who are listening to me may become what I am, except for these chains. And that really gets to, to, to Paul's heart for what's going on and, and what ought to be our heart um, when we encounter those uh, who, who don't know um, Jesus. And uh, I guess just to, to wrap it up, I know we're, we're running short on time. Um, just a couple of points, I think, from, from Agrippa's response. Uh, it's interesting here that... <clears throat> You know, we have a couple of responses. We have one, the response of, of Festus, who seems to be utterly just confused, um, basically accusing Paul of, of, of uh, insanity. Um, but, you know, I think that that's really coming from him not having really any understanding uh, of, of the prophets and of, of uh, Scripture, uh, unlike uh, Agrippa, who, again, is, uh, comes from a Jewish background, would have had some knowledge of this. And so... And Paul seems to indicate that he, he understands and he knows that, that Agrippa at least gets this at some level. Um, and so Agrippa's response you know, to, to Paul's question of not really directly answering the question and then ultimately uh, walking away um, is his response. Uh, Paul 
specifically asked him if he, if he believed the prophets, if he believed all of this, um, and he walked away. And it's, it's quite sad, um, literally walked away. It's, it's, uh, it, it was really a sad response, but um, I think that nonetheless, uh, Paul um, really did what he was, was called to do and, and what we we're called to do. Some might walk away and might not respond or, fa- or respond favorably. But, you know, it, at the end of the day, this, is, this, is, um, this ought to be our attitude. This ought to be what we, we want to do. And not everyone's going to hear the message and, and turn their life away um, from darkness. Um, the ironic part here in the end, uh, you know, we see in, in verse 32, you know, Agrippa says to, to uh, Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not, if, if he had not appealed to Caesar. That's the last verse uh, in, in the chapter. And, and it's ironic because, the, you know, from their perspective, they seem to be uh, voicing some, some grief for Paul. Paul's not sad about what's going on at all. Paul is, is ready to go on to Rome. He wants to go on to Rome. Uh, he knows that he's, he's going to Rome. And, and so he's, he's not sad at all. He's in chains and he's not sad. I mean, this is why uh, Festus thinks that, that Paul's insane. He's, he's a man in chains in front of all these people. And, and he seems to be perfectly happy. And he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. Um, and, and he's just talking about this, this message of hope for all humanity. And, and Festus thinks he's insane. Um, and these people seem to, to just be grieving that Paul, you know, he didn't really actually do anything lo- wrong according to Roman law, but we have to send him on anyways. And, you know, presumably they're sad because he, they're sending him on to death. Um, but they're the ones who are dead. <laughs> they're the ones who literally moments before turned their backs on the gospel. And so it, it's... Um, it's an ironic and, and kind of sad ending to the to the to the chapter here, um, but it's uh, Paul's. I think Paul's message and Paul's um, attitude and all of this, I think, is an encouragement to us. And so, really, just in conclusion, um, you know, I think that number one, again, we need, we ought to follow Paul's example. You know, our testimonies are uh, a powerful thing and a powerful way to reach others. Um, so we should be prepared to, to offer it um, when the moment comes. Um, you know, two is that God's uh, redemptive plan of redemption is amazing. I mean, we just saw going all the way back to, to Genesis um, where it all began. And, and this plan was to include all people. You know, kings, no matter what station in life you are, um, rich, poor, didn't matter. It was for everyone. And Paul understood that, and he was, he was again ready to share in front of this, this people that we might not enc- you know, encounter on a day-to-day basis, presidents and, and kings and people that, you know, if, could you imagine yourself in front of the president and being ready to speak um, to him? And I think uh, Ken mentioned a couple weeks ago, Billy Graham was that man um, in our lifetime, in our era, I guess. But, you know, again, I think that all of us should be ready to do that. And it, it, you know, not everyone is, is gifted in those ways, but... Uh, we should all be ready to share with others, um, uh, you know, God's, God's plans. And so, um, and finally, I just want to say that each one here, you know, we're all going to face a trial in our lives. Um, and in those moments, we need to keep our eyes uh, fixed on Jesus um, and, you know, being the author and the finisher of our faith. And so that's, um, that's what we also see here in, in Paul's, Paul's defense is he never loses his focus at all on what's important and who Jesus is. So, uh, thanks, and uh, we'll pray. Let's pray. Father, uh, again, thank you uh, for this, this passage, for Paul's example that we've uh, just read here. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would be um, allowing this uh, to these thoughts to, to marinate in our minds, and I just pray that um, ultimately, Lord, Lord, it would result in... Um, in action and for each one of us here that we would uh, we would continue to um, grow in you and to be uh, ready to share uh, with others and, and uh, ready to, um, to to just express the, the love of Jesus to, to people around us Lord and just 
uh, and eager and brave and, and, and all of these things, Lord. We need, we need courage. Uh, we need to be prepared. And I just pray that you would guide us in all of that. Um, just uh, thank you again uh, for this time and, and this place, Lord. We just uh, pray now that you would, uh, would bless uh, each one as we uh, go off through the rest of our day. In Jesus' name, amen.